Hey, what is up, everyone? Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles. We are your host. I am Donnie. I am Chris. And I'm Bill. Hey, we've had some time off. What's everybody been up to? Getting poor. Spending money. Stuff around the house. I went down to Mississippi in my crooked letter, crooked letter, I, humpback, humpback guy. Help I think you left out a couple of crooked yeah, letters. <laughs> Help my grandma celebrate her 92nd birthday. Shout out to her. Hey, happy birthday, grandma. Yeah. 92. 92. Yeah. Should also be so lucky. I mean, she's doing great too, right? Oh yeah. Oh man, that's. She that's, has a few setbacks, but she's doing good. I mean, don't you want you want them jeans right there, don't you? Oh yeah. Yeah, that's 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 what everybody well, wants. I can't fit in her jeans. Though, oh sure. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Still kicking like a chicken now, huh? Kicking like a chicken. Nothing wrong with that. That's it. Yeah, we took some time off. Uh, everybody, Bill up went out of town. Chris went to the beach, and I didn't go anywhere. Been working on a few things, trying to get a website going, getting some merchandise going, t-shirts and different things and it's very close so everybody stay tuned for that because we've got some killer stuff on the way we got a lot of birthdays all at once uh, my my daughter and my wife had the same birthday and then my uh, other daughter has a birthday coming up so just trying to get the yard prepared for that i mean we we don't take a lot of time to mess with our yard i know a lot of people are uh, are yardies and they all they do is just mess with the yard they get to have the greenest grass and they have the prettiest of flowers and they have all the decorations and everything, but I've had a Camaro sitting in my yard for two years. I really don't take care of my yard that much. So you, your wife and your daughters have the same birthday. They were born on the same day. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Um, and of course, you know, the other one, she, her birthday's on Cinco de Mayo. And, um, the only people that's going to celebrate more than us are the, our neighbors, which they'll be celebrating for a different reason. But, um, yeah, uh, finally got that Camaro moved. Hey, I think he's been a, in a cocoon forever. He let, the spot it left. Holy crap. You don't have to cut the grass there, though. That's true. That's true. I, but uh, probably have to hide it with a trampoline so it don't look so bad. It just, I, it looks terrible, but I'm just glad to see it go. I was actually expecting to see a snake. So. No, that's a cobra. That's a mustang. <laughs> oh, no, never in my yard. You planted a Mustang. You planted never. a Chevrolet trying to get a Mustang. Now, even if I had a junkyard, dude, yeah, I wouldn't have a Mustang buddy. there. <laughs> well, coming up this weekend, I've got a big gig. Uh, it's uh, May 3rd and 4th, if this gets out in time. I hope it does. I'm also working on a, a local article or interview with a guy that, that's putting it on. We'll be playing the State Line Music Festival this weekend. That's a... Uh, 12 o'clock on the 4th, but it's going from May 3rd and May 4th, but we're coming on at 12 o'clock, starting the whole shindig off. That's about it for me, though. All right. But you're going to get an interview with them guys down there, yeah. right? All I'm right. supposed to get it insert here. <laughs> That's what we want. We want to get the word out and give everybody a chance and give them a spot on our, our episodes. Oh, by the way, that's Roadside Alice. Oh, and you can go to Roads, www. <clears throat> Donnie ain't the only one been working on a uh, website www.roadsidealice.com and sorry for the sound right now uh, Bill and I are sharing a mic so it's going to go back and forth or possibly just stay like this where we're both kind of just away from the microphone just double kind of teaming to sh- on the mic yeah just sharing the mic <laughs> don't get too close to the mic uh, that's right <laughs> I know this Bill's leaning back a little bit from the mic <laughs> yeah what do you want you get closer Bill I ain't going to bite man Jeez, all, right. My bad. all right, guys, let's get into this week's episode. Don't give me a damn tic-tac. Yeah, I need a tic-tac. All right. We're doing a, a story on Brenda Sue Brown. Um, I told Bill about this story and Chris about this. This little girl was murdered in Shelby, North Carolina, which is in our county. I mean, it's like 10 miles from right here from the crack house in 1966. And... I had heard a lot about this, but I didn't know much of the details. You know, the Shelby Star, the local newspaper here, came out a while back and had a, run a series of articles on this, trying to build it back up because the case went cold after she was murdered. Forty years. Huh? Forty years. Forty years. I believe it was actually 2005 or six when they did that. Oh. Yeah. But yeah, it went cold. And, I mean, they they had some suspects over the years, but not, they couldn't really ever pin it on anyone. To get down to Brenda Sue, she was born on May the 15th, 1955, and she died on July 27th, 1966. She was abducted right off of Lafayette Street there in Shelby. What had happened that morning, 
from everything I heard and read, her and one of her little sisters, they got in a fuss over a makeup compact. And I don't know if it was her punishment or or what, but she she had to walk her younger sister to a daycare Head Start program, I think it was. When she got her there, left her, you know, they waved goodbye to each other, but that was the last time Brenda Sue was ever heard or seen again. After Brenda wasn't heard from, her mom started going door to door looking for her, asking if anybody had seen Brenda. What kind of time frame we're looking at here where she waited? It was just a couple hours. I think it was around 10 o'clock, 10, 15, when her, her mother started looking for her, going door to door, riding up down the road, seeing if anybody had heard from her. And nobody had. It was nothing. And it was about that time, maybe a little bit later, that she got the Shelby Rescue involved. And they started looking in that area. And they were combing the neighborhood. Bill's doing selfies for Instagram right now. But that's cool, too. And Am I distracting? No, no, no. Don't bring it up. No. <laughs> I'm glad you're you're happy with your, your looks enough to where you can take selfies. Um, not me. I got a big, big nose no, that takes up the whole camera. But it was uh, about 6.45 that evening where I read in one article where her body was found. But the, the former sheriff, uh, uh, not the sheriff, but the Shelby police officer, Harold Smith, said it was just a couple hours after they started searching, they found her. So I don't know which, which is to believe on that. That's, that's a pretty big time frame. Because if you're looking for it in a couple hours, it's probably just after lunchtime or something like that. But, you know, that's what the sheriff, not the sheriff, well, I keep saying the sheriff, the the Shelby police officer said, but the article, the several of the articles went at 6.45 p.m. when she was found. So, I, you know, I don't know which one to go with on that. But when they found her, she was under a pile of debris, limbs, tree branches. It looked like it had been freshly cut. She had been stripped naked. She didn't have any clothes on. And uh, her clothes were neatly folded on top of the debris. And her her head had all been, also been smashed in with a rock. And after an autopsy was performed, it was found that uh, she had 12 skull fractures. She'd been hit 12 times. And the bloody rock that she'd been hit with was right there next to her. And also, since uh, when they found her, you know, they found her, she didn't have any clothes on her, but she hadn't been raped. So we're, that's a little bit... Uh, something we're going to get into in a little bit later that deals with another story that sort of ties into this with another murder victim that sort of is sort of parallel to Brenda's. The detectives believe that the killer was walking down the street and not driving because um, you know this is one thing I don't agree with either. They said that you know if the they'd been driving in a car, it'd been too easy to spot somebody getting out of a car and dragging a kid into the woods, but. I know you know that area, don't you, Bill? Yeah, the sort of over near skate ramp. Yeah, it's right in there. <clears throat> and you know, at six, 1966, you know, I wasn't but a year old, so I don't, you know, I don't know what the traffic was like back then during that in that area. You're saying that is not a plausible theory. You know, I don't I think it's it sounding like it. I, I could, I, I, I agree with, I agree with, I agree with the assumption that that's what could happen. Yeah, but I mean, somebody just, you know, if you. Somebody walking down the street, you're going to notice somebody walking down the street. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I, I, I agree that it's probably somebody that lived close to it, not yeah. just walking down the street. I, I agree that it's not somebody in a car, or I, I, I could tend to agree with that theory mm-hmm. more than I could somebody walking down the street, either one of them. But what I'm saying is, yeah, it's probably somebody on foot, the way I see it. But then that, that's been brought. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it was somebody in a car, you know, because yeah. But I don't think it's because they were, you know, like they stated that they would have been seen a lot more. Right. You know, I don't think that's. I think it was somebody on foot, but for a different reason. I don't think. Okay, y'all gonna have to explain something to me because it is a main thoroughfare. It's oh, it's a it's a it's a street. it's a very busy street. Yeah. I wow, would I wouldn't consider myself a Shelbyan. I don't go to Shelby a lot, um, but I, I, you have to explain to me how's the layout. Why would it take? Why would it be hard for somebody to get out of the vehicle to take somebody to the woods? Is it because they'd have to cross the road? Well, no, we're saying that, that 
there would be a car, a big car sitting there on the side of the road that, <clears throat> hmm, I guess I'm saying it leaves a trail. Like, people are apt to notice a car sitting on the side of the road. As opposed to somebody walking down the street. Yeah. Yeah, these people walk down the road, you know, all the time. You might remember them, but. I mean, me and you just saw a guy up here on the side of the street up here walking on the side of the road. But. Well, could, could they not have just had her walk to the woods? Yeah, but what we're saying is the car would be sitting there on the side of the road. Somebody getting out of it. And getting, yeah, there are more chances. You could sneak around. You could be following her and nobody see you. You could be in, he could have been in the woods and come out and got him and took it back in. Nobody would probably see you. Dude, people, people don't pay attention. Back I mean, then they did. Now they don't. We live in a fast society. Back then, yeah. They well, I all I know is this is completely off point. But whenever we were driving home from the beach, there was a guy lay down on the bank off of three twenty one, with, with like this right here, with his arms and his legs just spread straight out, laying on the bank like he was dead, and everybody just driving right by. <laughs> including well, that's us. my point. Yeah. Today, that's no big deal. Well, yeah, you I see somebody, people more apt to stop and say, "Hey, buddy, you got a problem?" And yeah. They they notice things then. They don't notice them now. Okay. Okay. Sure. I wouldn't lie. I don't know. That's where the old man history kicks in. Okay. This, this area, too, there, there was a, a, a cotton mill there. And it was, uh, I think, everybody that lived in that little area. I think it was Lily Mill. Uh, sure. I think it was. And everybody that lived in that area knew everybody. And it was just a little mill area, mill houses. And, you know, they, they everybody knew everybody. So, but anyway. It's always in the... Everybody, it's a small little town. Everybody knows everybody. We never expect anything like this to happen. That's where most murders happen. That's why I go eat out of town, so I don't have to sit and look at anybody <laughs> I know and won't come up and shake my hand while I'm eating. <laughs> the only place where that does not uh, relevant to is Charlotte. People die there every day. All right. At the time, police had several suspects, including an unidentified white bald man who had exposed himself to Brenda and her sisters a few days before the murder and a local 13-year-old boy who was mentally disabled named Robert Roseborough. But they didn't have any leads or any kind of anything to make an arrest on a bald-headed man that exposed himself to her. Did he ever get arrested for exposing himself? They never found him. They never found him. They never, everything I read, there was no, nothing. They found nothing on that bald-headed man that exposed himself. But did they know he had exposed himself to him before the murder happened? I'm sure. Well, it's Brenda. Well, her sister. I guess Brenda told her mom or somebody. And I don't know if it was already like an investigation on him before the murder happened. Mm, he said it that probably was because they couldn't find him. I just didn't know if it was one of those things where they didn't know about until after she she died, and they were like, "Oh, well, it could have been this guy." Because a couple of days ago, he exposed himself to us. I don't know if it was one of those deals or not. So anyway, there were there were no leads, no sufficient evidence. Actually, Brenda Sue's murder became a cold case. Roseboro was briefly questioned by police, and when Officer Harold Smith questioned Roseboro at the police department, he said Roseboro remained silent. He didn't, he didn't even talk about anything. He said he wouldn't answer any of their questions. So he sat there, and his silence made him more suspicious. The public, you know, they were baffled why Roseboro, who was seen in the area of the morning of Brenda Sue's murder, was not, not interrogated more of the murder. They didn't, they didn't investigate him anymore. So... I asked you this question earlier, but I'll do it again for the listeners. There are many degrees of mentally disabled. Some, maybe he was not talking because he just wasn't mentally there enough to answer questions. I'll go one better than that. Maybe he was a young black man in 1966 South. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if the police officers are white or not. I don't know. And, it, you know, it was pretty bad about that time, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, it was a lot of... And not to discount that if he was mentally handicapped and he couldn't do it, I would just say that, like I said, there are different levels. I mean, I've, you know, I've, I've known uh, several, not a lot, but several uh, mentally handicapped people. Some you could never tell. Some function just like anybody else. It could just be a small tick or something like that that, big, you know, puts them in that classification of you know mentally handicapped obviously some that also are very quiet and you know they only talk to certain people and don't interact very much at all so that's, that was my reason for asking but i mean yeah they had but they had nothing to go on with roseboro as far as brenda sue's murder they had no 
anything to go on. But they believed that he killed Brenda Sue. Uh, even Roseboro lived just a few hundred yards from where Brenda's body was found. And when the case was reopened, detectives visited Roseboro in prison, but he refused to talk about uh, the murder. And the reason he was in prison, he was convicted in 1969 for a 1968 murder of uh, Mary Helen Williams. So, but what is really strange about this case, uh, Mary Helen, she worked at uh, Mary's Cannon Towel Outlet there in Shelby. Yeah, it's all gone now. Hmm? They've all been torn down now. Yeah, there's nothing Progress. like Progress. Yeah. Even Blanton's Toy House is out there. You remember Blanton's Toy House? I heard of it now. Oh, man. That was, around there then. that was the bomb. But um, it was an old house. Yeah, it was pretty cool. But anyway, um, it was Mary Cannon's Towel Outlet that uh, was on Dixon Boulevard there in Shelby, but the sign was closed hanging in the window. There was a girl that looked in the window and saw a young woman lying on the floor that was covered in blood. And police were called to the, to the business where Robert Roseboro walked out with his hands in the air. Mary Helen Williams was found nude. Her body was beaten, stabbed with a pair of scissors. And the county coroner later said that even though Mia, uh, Ms. Williams was found stripped of her clothing, she had not been raped. She had been hit. She'd been hit in the head also. Yes, she had. But that wasn't, I think, the stab wound was in her chest is what actually killed her. Mm -hmm. uh, in the store's restroom, police found Ms. Uh, Ms. Williams' dress and underwear. And at the time of Ms. Williams' murder, that's when the racial segregation was intense there in Shelby. And that's when the Ku Klux Klan were threatening uh, to harm Roseboro if uh, you know something wasn't done about it. But anyway, during the, the two-day trial murder trial, the pathologist testified that blood type found on Roseboro's clothes was type A, which matched Ms. Williams' blood type. But Roseboro denied killing Ms. Williams, saying he said that detectives did lied about, they lied about the investigation and said he had no motive for murder, being that it was no rape or robbery. So I, I, don't, I don't know what they mean by that, but yeah. I mean, that's, that's sort of neither here, neither here nor there. It's pretty, it's pretty suspicious looking. But then, as especially going, coming out with the hands up, yeah, and and well, and as we get into it, I mean, I ain't saying he didn't do it, I don't know, but uh, as we get into it on down, you'll see that there was other things that it make it doesn't look like he did the first one. It looks like he did the first. It looked like he did both of them. Let me put it that way. But then, as you hear other things that come out, it, it sort of well, he might have done one of them, but he didn't do the other one. Mm -hmm. But anyway. Roseboro was found guilty of murder of Mary Helen Williams and was sentenced to death. The sentence was reduced to life in prison because of the similarities between Helen, Mary Helen Williams' murder and Brenda Sue. Murder, uh, it became a common belief that Roseboro had committed both. Right. That's what everybody, what you just said, everybody believed that, you know, since he done one, he done, done the other one since they were, they paralleled each other. You know, they were, they were both found nude. I think the only difference in it was that Brenda Sue's clothes were folded neatly. Yeah. And hers were just like disheveled. Like, it's, I tell you, just thinking about what I read and everything, it's almost like he wanted it to be like that, but he didn't know everything mm -hmm. to make it look like that. So, I mean, it could have been a copycat deal. Yeah, it could have been. You know what I mean? Because <clears throat> different murders uh, will leave the crime scene in, in a different way. Some, some are, more, are, are more likely to leave like a cleaner look. As weird as that sounds, like clean, like folding up clothes and making like a neat pile of brush rather than just throwing stuff around. It just depends on what you're looking. If it's more of a hate crime, it won't be like that. It'll just, it'll be just just disorganized and stuff like that, and they won't put very much thought into it. So by having to fold the clothes and everything, there could have been some kind of um, degree of like remorse, maybe. Mm -hmm. And then maybe with the second one, with it not being like that, it may have been more intense or like anger put into it and if he done it maybe he changes his mo a little bit maybe you know the way he done you know if he if he murdered brenda sue then you know he folded her clothes neatly maybe he just changed what some, done something different when you look at serial killers usually they all do it the, the same way ted bundy usually they have like a calling card that's, the, what, that's what i was getting at if he if he if let's okay let's say if he had this mental disability and it traumatized him through the question and everything. He knew enough to do it to somebody else, but he stabbed. They didn't stab her. So it was a, it was a, a killing of opportunity. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The only thing they had was a rock. Well, maybe she had scissors laying around, and he knew enough that the girl died and da-da-da, she was this, this, and that, but he didn't know every detail. See what I'm saying? So yeah. he, he, only, he can only recreate half the crime. Mm-hmm. The important part, but still. But getting back to the, them uh, being on trial, Roseboro, he was subpoenaed to Cleveland County to determine if enough evidence for existed for Brenda Sue Brown's murder, there was a murder suspect, Thurman Price. And during the testimony, which lasted less than 10 minutes, Roseboro denied killing Brenda Sue or knowing who did or having any remembrance of the day she was murdered, saying, you're talking something about something that happened 40 years ago. How would I recall something that long ago? And reopening the case in 2005, Brenda Sue's sisters, Patricia Buff and Mary McSwain, spent months asking the Shelby Police Department to open the case. But officers told uh, them Brenda Sue's case files were missing. And after four days of searching, they did find boxes of, of her evidence and her, her stuff. Even, they were even unmarked. They, there was nothing mar- uh, indicating. But uh, they, the boxes still had Brenda Sue's dress, her underwear, shoes, and even that uh, makeup powder puff compact was still there. The girls uh, f- had a fuss over that morning. I think the rock was there. You that was used to kill yeah. her with too. I think it was still but in that box. Some vials of blood missing and something else. Yeah, hmm. yeah. But you're talking forty years later. I mean, it's and the Mary Helen Williams stuff was with it. I believe. Yeah, it was all in the same. Yeah, yeah but you got it. That's kind of weird too, putting both of them in the same because they had to. They had to believe that. Those two, those two cases were connected. You've, you've got to keep that stuff. I mean, it's just crappy police work to me. Yeah. I mean, you, but but you got to keep it. There's a lot. Some there's more murders that get solved than there do that that do not. So, I mean, even if they got to somehow build a, a whole another station to, to keep this stuff, you got you've got to try. And and it happens a lot to where evidence gets lost or something like that and I just that's just crazy I, I, it don't happen much today it's usually stuff that happened you know a while back or something which I understand I mean there's time that, that you know lapsed between the two but I mean come on I think they're a lot better at keeping that stuff now than they were back then I mean it's but even the, like Bill said there was some other stuff missing it was a uh, fingernail scrapings hair uh, 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 tree branches that were also missing that they had collected at that time. And the only thing they found was a palm print. Yeah, there's a bloody, bloody palm print on one of her shoes. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunate. So, yeah, but but on uh, May 15, 2006, the remains of Brenda Sue were exhumed in Spring Hill Church Road Cemetery in Lillington. Where is Lillington, North Carolina at? North Avenue. Okay, out, out toward I was out that way last week, too. Okay. But it, it, what? Yeah, I never found anything why that happened. I don't know why she was buried out there. I mean, they they she was born in Sanford, Harnett Sanford, yeah, but it's Harnett County, I think. Yeah, and I, I understand that, but to all my knowledge, her family lives out here. Still. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I never could find anything on why they moved here from where she was born and why she was buried out there in Lillington. I I couldn't find anything so, on that. I didn't. I didn't come across it in research now, but in the in the when the original articles came out, I remember reading that her mom was working night shift and she had just got off. And that's and she would, the way I remember reading the Shelby Star article was she laid across the bed so Brenda could take her to school and she was supposed to come right back. Mm-hmm. And then I think and there was something and I don't want to I don't like putting in family stuff, but I remember reading something that. The dad wasn't home for whatever reason. That either he was supposed to be home or he hadn't got home. And that's another reason she was just going to let her go. And you know, you got to look too. 1966, that was a totally different time. I mean, I wasn't even around then. Yeah. But uh, not for three more months. But, uh, you know, and it, it was common nature for kids six years old and whatever oh, yeah. to walk to school by themselves. It was a, you know, it was a very innocent time because I even read too that with this happening, it caused everybody in that area to become more aware, locking their doors at night. Because you didn't have to. You know, everybody knew everybody. You didn't lock your doors when you went to bed. You didn't lock your car doors. You didn't lift your windows open all night. Do y'all have any family members remember that remember this happening? I don't live up here then. Mm, no, nah, I don't. I mean, they probably did, but I hadn't 
We hadn't. I hadn't discussed it with. I know. Any I know. I don't have any because you know we're, I'm not from around this area, but I didn't know if y'all did because y'all kind of live out this way. No. Okay. No, but I mean, it was several, several articles in the Shelby Star on it, and that you know gave a resurgence to this case. But back in what was 2005, 2006. Yeah. But you know, I hadn't, I hadn't talked to anybody about it, and it come back out in 2006. You know, Shelby Star run a, a series of articles on this, and when they did, it was a, it was a 13 part 40th anniversary, and but shortly after that, uh, a woman named Lori Leo came forward to the police claiming that her grandfather, named uh, Earl Mickey Parker, told her that sh uh, shortly before his death, on um, June 26, 2002, which was uh, everybody said it was, it was a deathbed confession that he and a man named Thurman Price killed Brenda Sue Brown. And the indictment indicates that uh, Mickey, Earl Mickey Parker described in detail how Brenda Sue was killed, and according to authorities, his confession to his granddaughter is consistent with the evidence found at the crime scene in 1966. So I don't know if he – I've got some – got some problems with this. I don't know, you know, if, if he told detailed stuff that – you know how the police don't tell everything, and he knew exactly some things that they didn't tell, or you know maybe he was on his deathbed, and maybe he was highly medicated. Yeah, but why would you bring that up on your deathbed? You know, uh, I don't know. I don't... But it makes sense though. Just maybe, the, go ahead and tell the rest. Maybe of the maybe he you know maybe he had read an article on it. And it was on his mind, him being highly medicated, maybe he was on morphine or something else. And, I mean, he just just telling a story. Yeah. I mean, I mean, my, uh, my son had his wisdom teeth taken out a couple weeks ago. And, I mean, he was just on some light stuff. And, man, he was laying there talking some crazy stuff. So, I, you know, I don't know. If yeah, that's, that's pretty random to bring up i mean yeah random stuff is one thing like you know i saw a lot or something like that but to bring up something happened all that time ago i mean pre something pretty specific i mean your son probably brought some crazy stuff but it wasn't anything no it wasn't nothing like killing nobody but I mean, he, he was on very light stuff he was talking off the top of his head weird stuff and but anyway they said a deathbed confession was consistent with the evidence found at the crime scene and according to court records, Leo called the family Brenda Sue on April 3rd, 2006, and told Brenda Sue's sister that the killer is Thurman Price, but left out her grandfather's involvement. But on February the 12th, 2007, it, uh, the Shelby police arrested Thurman Price. He was 79 at the time on first-degree murder charges based on a deathbed confession. Okay. Well, think about this. You got somebody you don't like, and you want to pay them back. Yeah, that, and I was you, you, you tell him a deathbed confession, then you die. It's a world of hurt for that homeboy. I mean, yeah, I was going to get into that too. I mean, what if what if he had some kind of grudge against Thurman Price? What if he, you know? Yeah, because they when there ain't going to be no debate. They know? had history. Yeah, I mean, they, they obviously knew each well, other. And go ahead. Let's see. Uh, Price's home was located uh, within proximity of Brenda's where Brenda Sue's body was found. But it's unclear whether he lived there in 1966. I'm sure they can find records, but they didn't know at the time. And according to records, Price did not purchase the home until 1973. Uh, Price was released from jail in February 2007 on a $50,000 bond and denies any involvement with the, the death of Brenda Sue. Now, on uh, May 10th, 2007, Earl Mickey Parker, his body was exhumed from Sunset Cemetery to see if his palm print matched the bloody one found on Brenda Sue's shoe. The results to the test were inconclusive as Parker's hands were too deteriorated to get a print, so they couldn't find out anything like that. But prior to the criminal record, uh, in 1954, Parker, who was 26, and Price, who was 25, were indicted together for the rape of a girl named Shirley Gant, a 12-year-old girl in Patterson Springs. I have a question. Yeah. When did they start the fingerprint database where they had people's, uh, like, Fingerprints. And I mean, it was probably still. It was probably then. I mean, they, can you not get DNA from a dead body? If it's not, if it's not, uh, if it's decomposed, you can't. Yeah, but see, they didn't leave any DNA on Brenda Sue. I mean, there was nothing. They, had nail they lost them. Oh, yeah. 
I mean, it, there was no nothing left in the box. Well, I'm, I'm saying that, that the FBI should have uh, some kind of a database where it has fingerprints. I don't know if they do palm prints or not. Would you think if they do f- fingerprints, would they not do palm prints as well? They, I don't think so. I think it's just matters. Well, yeah. yeah, but if it, if it was in their database, they could have they could have just used it from a database rather than having to dig him up and then. Dude, 1966. They no, no, database. they did this in 19. It, yeah, they did this 2007. He was. They were com- they were charged with the rape or the attempted rape in 1954. Yeah. Yeah, but when when were they released? They never went. They never mm-hmm. did anything. They never got in prison or nothing. Oh, okay. They were given a three to five year suspended sentence. So and they had to they had to keep a job, they not drink, drink alcohol, alcohol, and pay two hundred forty dollars. That sounds more like probation to me. Yeah. yeah, you can call it what you want to, but they didn't go to prison. <laughs> but still, it sounds like it sounds like I mean, probation it, to me. I mean, it ain't right. I mean, but I mean, that's all they got. I mean, they 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 got a slap on the wrist. Oh yeah, yeah, and that's what I'm saying. If 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 you're a convicted felon, I thought they automatically took your fingerprints and stuff like that. I'm, I'm sure they got your fingerprints somewhere, but uh, the only thing that was found on Brenda Sue was the palm print. I mean, I guess they done palm prints. They just done fingerprints. Okay, all right, fair enough. Yeah, so I mean, they had nothing to go on there. But anyway, the Cleveland County judge ruled that um, Earl Mickey Parker's deathbed confession and Lale's testimony will be admitted evidence at trial. So that's what they had to go on, just a deathbed confession. Sure. And uh, told her on his deathbed that he and Thurman Price killed Brenda Sue in 1966. Thurman Price maintained his innocence until his death on August 4th, 2012, awaiting trial. I will say, if he was just going to throw that other guy under the bus, he wouldn't have involved himself in it, right? Uh, he was dying. Though. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. If, if, if he was just going to trying to screw over old dude, he would have just said, oh, he did it. But he said he and the other guy did it. But maybe look, maybe he didn't care. Then it's just an accusation. If he puts himself in there, it adds more weight. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think about that, but yeah. Lori Lale recalled her grandfather's story and told her that uh, he walked to a local bootlegger's house the night before where he met Price, and they drank for several hours. And while walking home the next morning, they saw Brenda Sue near South Lafayette Street and sneaked up behind her with the intention of rape. Uh, Lale described how Parker told her that Price had grabbed Brenda, Brenda Sue and dragged her from the road to where there was this little black boy playing in a field. I guess that was Roseboro. And Price screamed after him to get home. Supposedly this was Robert Roseboro, is what they're saying too. According to Lale's grandfather's account, Brenda Sue fought back hard and scratched Price, with, which ticked him off. And he picked up a rock and hit her in the face and told Parker that he had to kill her because uh, they would go away and do real time this time. Because they didn't do anything. That's what they're saying. They, they didn't get no kind of conviction. They just had to pay. They got a slap on the wrist for the Shirley Gant. But the, they got caught for this one. They would do hard time. Think about this, too. Uh, say it was him. And say the police are investigating you. Okay, A, you're a little black boy or black young man in a – I don't know if you remember how, he, how old he was. but what I'm He was to 13 say, at the time. 13. All right. He probably has a figure of not only authority but white people. All right. So these guys tell him to get home. He gets home. Now, he doesn't know if they're in cahoots with each other or what. So would he not – would you not shut up if you didn't know who the players were? Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. you know, that. because let's put it this way. They can say he done it. Then that sticks him in there. Mm-hmm. He says they done it, and they don't believe him. Those guys know who he is, saw him there. They'll come back and get him. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, for every unsolved uh, Brenda Sue Brown case there is, there's probably 10 or 20 more per black person, uh, illegal alien. We just had this other week talking about a Northcott that, uh, you know, reason he picked on uh, uh, Mexican kids were nobody knew them. They, mm-hmm. didn't, they didn't care. They really, When you get down to it, they didn't care. So, yeah, you know, he's probably got that same, whether he knew it or not, he's probably thinking that same deal. Probably is. You're right. One thing I don't get, though, you know, uh, Thurman Price, you know, he died before he was actually went to trial. 
you know, they, they had a, a deathbed confession and uh, Lori Lell's statement saying you know, her grandfather uh, told her that they had planned to rape and murder. Well, they actually just planned to rape, but when he got scratched, I guess he got infuriated and killed her. But, you know, he, he died, people, uh, people thinking he had done it without a trial. I mean, he was already convicted in people's eyes. How long after he was convicted um, did he die? Well, he wasn't convicted. He was just uh, indicted. Okay, indicted. How, how long? Uh, like the next year. Yeah. Or what was it, 2000? Maybe it was. He died, in, he had died on August 4th, 2012, awaiting yeah, trial. 2012. He's old. They didn't get him in, in that courtroom, I would, I would imagine, right? I mean, it, time's a ticking, right? Yeah. If, if, it doesn't matter. If, 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 you, if you're knocking on heaven's door... No, no disrespect to any old people out there, but if, well, I mean, he was seventy eight, but he wasn't dying. I mean, he was. I mean, I mean, everybody, we're all dying. Well, of but, course, I mean, I'm just saying there, there's a point in time in your life when, when, when the time is is more fragile. That's what I'm saying. So why not hurry up the the process? Because I know some some court cases don't go to court for years. Hey, if you got a good lawyer, Same maybe. Reason. Hey, maybe if you got a good lawyer, he'll drag it out till you die and not have to go to trial in prison. If it was me and I was innocent, I would want to go then, like right then. I'd want to go as soon as possible. So if he was dragging it out for whatever reason, knowing there's not a lot of evidence, that would make me kind of curious about it. I don't know. I mean, if you were 78, 79 years old, would you not want your lawyer to drag it out so you know you wouldn't have to go to court? You wouldn't have to go to prison? If I was innocent, I would want to get it done. Yeah, yeah I can Because you see, have I nothing can. to worry about if you're innocent, right? Yeah, but that don't, ain't always the case. Yeah. I mean, it's... I know a lot of innocent people have been put in jail. But, I mean, what, you know, what gets me, you know, it, this Thurman Price, he may have done it. But they're going off a dead be- death be- deathbed confession and a statement from this guy's granddaughter. That's what they're going on. And, you know... I don't know if I don't know if that's enough to indict somebody. Yeah, you know, I just don't know. He probably would have won. It's suspicion. I mean, it's all it is. It's just he said, she said type of thing, and that don't hold up in court. I know uh, David Teddy, the lawyer in Shelby, was his lawyer at the time, and you know it may be lawyer talk, but he said that you know he didn't think that you know when it went to trial that uh, Thurman Price would be convicted. They didn't have enough evidence. Of course not. But I mean, there's know. people have a lot of evidence against them, and they still win. I mean, it, like I said, if if it's me and my name is being thrown out there, and I know I'm innocent, I would just go and just get it over with. Especially if it, there's no evidence, and you know, if you know you didn't do it, of course there ain't gonna be any evidence. I mean, if you're innocent, there's no evidence on you. Yeah, I just, I just don't know. I mean, you know, at the Robert Roseboro, you know, both those, the, his murder and the Brenda Sue Brown is. Very, very similar. And you know what? What was he doing in that that store anyway? What What was he doing in there? Nobody, I don't know. I've never, I hadn't found anything on that. He's, I, he's the common denominator between the two, ain't he? He pretty he, much is. He was there for both. But I mean, he uh, coincidence. He's in prison. I mean, he's still alive. He's in prison. And you know, but he he said he admits to this day that he didn't kill Brenda Sue Brown. Do you think the craziest criminal is the one who never admits to it or the one that um, admits to it? I'd say the craziest ones is the ones that never admit to it because that's, that's torture for the family. If they want to keep uh, torturing the family, you know, they won't admit it. They'll let them suffer. That's the crazy ones. Okay. Right. What about you, Bill? Mm-hmm. Let's see. If, well, I mean, you mean he's, he's crazy because he won't admit it? Yeah. Crazy because he won't admit it or ones that just be like, Oh, I killed her. I killed this person, this person, this person. Some people crazy because they killed somebody. What? My, here's my rule. Here's my rule. How many people did you kill this week? Uh, nobody. All right. How many people did you kill? I ain't killed nobody this I week. I ain't never killed nobody. Guess what? Unless your life, here's my rule. Unless your life or somebody else's life is being assaulted, the only reason you kill somebody is insanity. If you're not in a protective mode, you're insane. Think about it. It's not a big stretch. As long as you're protecting somebody, you're not insane if you kill somebody. But if you kill somebody for any other reason, you are insane. So there should not even be an insanity defense. 
Go ahead. I agree with you on that. I mean, it's just there's you know what I about think cops? Th- huh. What about cops and shit? Did you just hear what I said? Yeah. If you're not, is he protecting somebody? But, but, but is he protecting himself? But even an insane person can say they're protecting themselves and they're really not. It's not the same thing. I'm saying that cops are on TV all the time after they shoot a criminal and they'll say, I was protecting myself, yet there's always backlash saying, well, you wasn't. There's video. This eyewitness says he wasn't. I mean, if a cop shoots somebody, he could be insane. He could really be insane, but he could still say, oh, I was just doing my job. I was protecting myself or protect somebody else but truth be told he's just doing it just to do it i mean how, how, how can you tell if somebody's really insane anymore because what are they going to hold up cards in front of them tell them what they see i don't know my, my thing was normal people not cops normal people people that usually get killed get or killers you're insane unless you're protecting yourself or somebody you're insane there should not be an insanity defense let me ask y'all this: With some of the evidence that was gone, do y'all do you think that the cops may have intentionally done something with that with that uh, those that DNA, the hair, the nail scrapings, the blood on the the tree? But I mean the the rock. I mean, do you think? So is there is there any ties from the police to any of the suspects? No. Okay. I mean, well, I, mean I don't know who they would be trying to protect there. I, I mean, let's say she want trying. I would say they were, they were trying to protect their their record, maybe like the, the cop, because no no county, no no state, really no county wants to be known for a county couldn't solve a crime like a like a well known crime. So I mean, would they be? I don't think they would destroy evidence in that case because you always want to leave the door open that you can solve it one day. But I don't think they. I don't see why they would want to mess with it. Well, first of all, I lived here better part of twenty something years when this 40-year-old case brought back up, I'd never, ever heard of it. <clears throat> so, as far as the county being known, now, here's the other thing. Let's say this. If the cops are tampering with the evidence, and, okay, don't know what was gone, the, uh, the finger, nail scrapings, and blood, whatever. Yeah, okay. vials of blood, <clears throat> the little tree now, branches. Okay. So, 1966, 68, 69, who is the police going to help more? A 13-year-old black guy or two elderly white, or not elderly at that time, but two white guys? Now, I don't know what the racial mix in the police force was in 1966, 67, 68, or during that time. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it probably wasn't 50-50. I'm just, you know, 1966, 69. I would say, I wouldn't, I'd say it wouldn't be 50 that, 50. That's, mm-hmm. that's what I'm saying. So at, at best, 90 10, maybe. Mm-hmm. I'll give you 20 80. But what I'm saying is, it doesn't, anybody can get the key to the room if they're a cop. So what I'm saying is, I can see it being a family member or somebody that, or somebody connected to, to those two white guys tampering with evidence more than I could somebody that's connected to this young 13-year-old black guy. That's a good point, but why wouldn't they just tamper the evidence and make the black boy look guilty rather than just taking the evidence away? Well, How are you going to tamper to make it look like him if you got blood and stuff? You can't put his blood in there. You can only take away key evidence that's going to incriminate somebody else. It'd be easy, especially if he's uh, mentally handicapped. The same body is Roseboro is already he, in prison for another murder. Well, I'm saying that uh, if, if if he's mentally handicapped, and I don't, like I said, I don't know what degree he was, but he could be led to uh, touch certain things and get fingerprints off of there. Oh, his fingerprints on it. Or, I mean, it could happen. I mean, you look at uh, the, um, what's the Netflix um, thing, that, uh, Making a Murderer? The, the accusations of police temporal evidence there. I mean, stuff that was there at one point wasn't there next point, or, I mean, stuff that was mysteriously placed at the crime scene that should have been there. I mean, it could happen J- just as easy as they could have been sa- – if they were really trying to save the two white guys from getting accused, why not take the heat completely off of them by just putting fake evidence there? There again, it's 1966. It's a whole lot easier to get rid of the evidence than it is to create the evidence. 
See what I'm saying? Okay, let's say they got they got 10, 15 fingerprints on. They probably fingerprint when they investigate him. They had all kinds of stuff they get fingerprints on. They got to find a fingerprint on something else. If they could put it. Then you can't put a fingerprint on something. You can, you can grab somebody's hand and, and make them touch anything else. <laughs> okay. Oh, here's this bloody shoe. Here. Uh, you put your hand on. Now you can't do that. He was a kid. They can make him do anything. <laughs> okay. Well, that didn't happen, Chris. <laughs> well, they could. We don't know that, Bill. We weren't there. Remember, you were three months away from being born. Exactly. But anyway, I mean, I just think it's it's a it's a sad situation because I mean, you got Thurman Price who died, who was you know, indicted on this, but never brought to trial, you know, and the family believes that Thurman Price did it, but, you know, there's always that in the back of your mind, you know, he didn't go to trial, and and they, and they, they're they assuming that he done it, and he, he died, people thinking that he was a murderer, you know, even without a trial, and that, that you know, I like to see a trial, and, you know, if you got evidence, bring it forward, and, if he's convicted of murder in a court of law, then he's a murderer. But him to die and be thought of as a murderer, that, I, I put myself in that situation. I would, I would hate, you know, to die and, and people think of me as a murderer and not, you know, have my name cleared and knowing that, you know, what if, what if. That could have been the Earl guy's whole thing. Yeah, yeah. That could have been his, you know, his way of getting back. You know, maybe he had a feud, like, like Bill said, and. And um, that's his way of getting back. But if he was going to set him up, like I said, I don't understand why he would have put his name, his name into the mix. Like just to add, add more weight, like Bill said, add more weight. You know, if he's dying. What does it matter? I don't know. I I wouldn't to tell your your family member that is sitting right there with you if it was complete bull crap. That. So do you think he did it or didn't? It go either way. All right, let's just let's just let's just get off the. I mean, who who do you think killed Brenda Sue Brown? I mean, who do you think, Chris? Who do you think done it? I don't know. It's it's hard for me to think that one guy could be both crime scenes, even though they weren't completely the same. It's hard for me to believe that one guy was at both and didn't have anything to do with it, or didn't know anything. So I mean, I would lean more towards. Um, what's his name? Which one? Roseboro. Yeah, yeah Roseboro. Roseboro. I mean, I, I mean that that's just what I think. I mean, it could be completely off. I hate they got rid of all the evidence, but what do you think, Bill? Uh, for my vote, it goes to he's probably guilty on the towel place, and I think the guy, the two old men, did the other one. Yeah, it's, it's kind of weird though, you know, Roseboro being associated with two two murders like that. Yeah, I mean, it's like lightning striking the same place twice you know and i don't know I, yeah but when you look at the two old guys already had a, a rape charge yeah and then yeah they didn't rape her but you know they're not necrophiliacs probably but anyways i i still say if the guy had a, a mental problem that all that affect he may have seen it he may have watched it Mm-hmm. And it affected him, and then two years later, he goes, I can do that. So that's why I say the way I did. They had prior, and it leads you to believe almost it's going to be another prior. And, and you know, then you got him, I don't know. But did they know about the – well, I guess he was a suspect, so they knew he was there. Mm-hmm. And they could have laid that in there too. So still, I would really want to know the guy's mental state, Rosborough or whatever his name is. I really want to know his mental state yeah. because it all depends on that. What what kind of – what is he capable of? I mean, not everybody's capable of doing certain things. I mean, he, he may not have the intellect to do this or do that, or he may have complete intelligence. You just never know. So without having that information, I mean, it's kind of hard to really tell. I mean, in the course of the older dudes, I mean – I don't know. Uh, it's, I guess that's why it's unsolved, right? Well, I mean, it, it's not technically unsolved. The family believes that Thurman Price killed their sister, and that's what they're going with. And you know, it's opinion. It is. I mean, well, it's, that, just in my research, I didn't find a lot of stuff that I had in the Shelby article because I remember in the Shelby article 
they said there was a guy that was going around in a white car, and they had seen him. They had seen the white car like a day or two before, and then they saw it. I, I remember seeing, hearing, reading something about there was a white car that was linked to it somehow. And I think that guy had a white car. Of course, white was a pretty common color back in the day. But the know, Earl Mickey Parker? No, the, the Thurman guy. Thurman Price. Yeah. I remember that that was being part of the stuff that also linked him to it because mm. when it came down to it, it was like, dang, that boy did it. I can't. And I didn't find that in my research. I found the same thing you did, but I can, and I should have went back and read those showy articles. But that's why I went back, you know, asked about the, you know, if it was more plausible to you know notice somebody getting out of a car as opposed to somebody walking down the street, yeah. you know. But if if he was familiar with that area. And that guy, he could have parked it and then yeah, that's true. walking. Because people did park and walk. They didn't use a car like they we do now. It's because they had it. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I'm mm. sure there's a lot of people walked uptown instead of drove to, you know, now you get in the car and drive down two blocks, get out, drive down two more blocks. Now, then those times, they might even walk to town from, yeah. the, from that point, you know. Yeah, but this this uh, little area here, I mean, it was a little neighborhood. I mean, they had they had stores there. They had a grocery store, so they had, you know it was a little mill community. So they had everything in that, that area they needed. So they, they probably parked in one place and you know walk like you said, walk where they needed to go. So but anyway, that's our that's our story on Brenda Sue Brown. You know if if we missed anything or if you'd like to comment or weigh in on what we had to say, by all means leave us a, a comment. Email us at uh, crackhousechronicles at gmail.com. You can check us out on our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, anything like that, all of our social media platforms. What am I doing? You give a shout out. We're giving a shout out. Yeah, Angie Jimenez. Okay, give, uh, tell us what she said, Bill. She says, I've been binging on this, and now I'm waiting for more episodes to come out, and I'm addicted, but not to crack. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Angie Jimenez uh, thank you for listening uh, tell some more of your friends and get everybody checking us out and with that said we are out of here this is the Crack, Crack House, House Chronicles, Chronicles.